When a child reads something, he needs to read something that brings delight to his soul, value to his life, and it's acceptable. We live in a world where I think Satan is very clever in trying to convince us that some of the things that our kids are reading or watching can somehow be good for them, right? And even good for them spiritually. And I think this can be a very dangerous thing. And I know I'm going to, I am going to, I'm going to rock the boat a little bit and I'm going to have some people who are not going to love this question, but I'm going to ask it to you anyway, because I know that this is somewhat of a controversial um, area in the Christian world and in the Christian homeschool world. There are so many books like the Harry Potter series and other, you know, types of, of books, Call of the Wild, um, popular dystopian books, things like that, that a lot of parents will say, you know, it's okay. They can, there's a lot for them to learn from this. My kid really enjoys reading them. What are your thoughts on those types of books? Great question. I love this question. You ready? I don't know. Here we go. Okay, <laughs> I know so, what I think about it. I want to know what you think about it. Okay. So all literature comes from a person's worldview. Um, an author um, such as Harry, you know, Harry Potter series, you know, she has a worldview. She has a view of God that all, all literature, all books, and by the way, there's 2.2 million books printed every year, new books. That's, a lot, That's of a lot of books. Yeah. So how do we keep up with that? How do we know who's writing what? And how do we know what their background is? Yeah. So um, everyone is, is going to influence the people who read those books. Um, they're going to influence them by their worldview. They're going to, that's, that's who we are. We write about what we know, our own, our own um, knowledge, our accumulated effective knowledge. And so, um, so that's, that's number one. Do, do you know as a parent, have you done your due diligence to know, you know, what these authors are about? What's their lifestyle? You know, and, and so if they're, if they're living an immoral lifestyle, you know, then why do I want my kids to be influenced? Even, no matter how great their writing is. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where parents would take issue. Like the parents say, like, well, we're not going to just throw out the baby with the bathwater just because they're evil. They may be writing something really good. So why can't we learn from them? And that's right. what I want to talk about. And it's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Just happened to have my Bible open to it. Thought you were going to be asking me this question. We've got to find out what God wants for our children more than anything. God knows what's best. He created us. He knows what's best for us. He knows when we break rules, there are consequences. He knows what boundaries to give us. And he's given us boundaries in the books that our children read. It's in the word of God. You know, first, you know, the little, the little truths, you know, you know, think on things that are good, lovely, just, of good report. If there be any virtue, any praise, think on these things. And mm -hmm. so, you know, um, you know, the, let, let me digress a little bit. You know, okay. the dystopian literature, um, Call of the Wild. Call of the Wild, you fall in love with the uh, the dog that's, you know, being attacked. And you want this dog to kill the other dogs. Um, at the end of the book, you you are a believer in evolution, the survival of the fittest. Um, it is it is duped you to place to to put your guard down and to embrace by your emotions, someone who's been taken advantage of, and you want the other dog, you want this dog to win. You want him, the survival of the fittest, you want that, that comes into your mind and you accept it as a, a new value because of what you just read. The same thing's true with, with um, Harry Potter. I'm just going to just briefly describe that. You're going to end up, the um, ends justify the means. Um, you're going to learn that with Harry Potter. And then you're going you're to see some other subtle things happen, immoral things happen in Harry Potter too. Lying, um, sexuality, all of that's in there. Um, dystopian literature. Now, if I had not done this study, I, lo I love dystopian movies. I love the dystopian stories. They're amazing. But what people don't realize is that they don't really read with a critical eye and discernment. And discernment's everything. Um, right. uh, Proverbs chapter 2 teaches us that if we, um, if we search for wisdom more than hidden treasure, that we will understand the fear of the Lord. And by the way, the fear of the Lord is the beginning. I'm going to, now, Yvette, I'm going to give you a, a trick question. You're going to probably answer it wrong. You ready? Sure. Okay. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of? Wisdom. Knowledge. Uh, ah, too bad. You got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Knowledge. <laughs> that was a great, that was a great catch. Good save, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> You're <was> welcome. <laughs> nine, nine out of 10 people say wisdom. <laughs> Um, in Wisdom in chapter 9, 
You know, it's chapter one, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Chapter nine, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It takes 12 lessons of wisdom that the child has to learn in order to reach wisdom in chapter nine. Mm -hmm. But he's got to learn all 12 lessons first. In the beginning, this fear of the Lord, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If that's true, then we need to find the source of this knowledge, which is the fear of the Lord. And the Bible spells it out clearly. It even tells you the fear of the Lord is this. Guess what it mm -hmm. is? Hate what God hates and love what God loves. Right. It's simple. L learn to love what God loves and hate what God hates. As you're reading something, if you're reading something that is against God's boundaries, mm -hmm. it violates God's character, then we're to hate that. We're not to continue to say, oh, I can learn something from this. That's wrong. You know, we don't learn from evil. Jesus never, ever learned from evil. He, just, he didn't go in that direction. Right. He always taught us what was good and holy. Okay, so... So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And then in chapter 2, it says this. It says, if you search for wisdom more than hidden treasure, you will understand the fear of the Lord. But you've got to search for it with all your heart. You'll understand the fear of the Lord. And it says, then you will find the knowledge of God. And then guess what happens next? <laughs> I love this part. And wisdom or, and knowledge will become pleasant to your soul. I love that. This is in chapter 2. When knowledge starts to become pleasant to someone's soul, so when they're reading something, there's people will have a certain sense about what they're reading. It'll either make them feel joyful mm -hmm. and fulfilled, or it'll put this unfulfilled uneasiness inside of them. God's given us a conscience to see that. Right. And when they're reading something, and if they if they have a conscience that is that is working, you know, because they've not been filled with all this other stuff that's that's harmful, yeah. right. then they're going to start seeing what's bad. And this is what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter twelve. Um, this is a hard pill to swallow, but it's in the Bible. Um, besides being wise, the preacher, and by the way, the word preacher is the word for collector. He's collecting things. He's collecting the words, the most important words in the universe. That's what, that's what Ecclesiastes is all about. People will live life either under the sun, temporary, mm -hmm. unfulfilled, or they'll live life under, under the perspective of heaven. And so we want our children to live life under an eternal perspective rather than a temporary perspective. Right. Because when, when you live life under a temporary perspective, it's shallow. It's, you know, I'll take what comes every day, whatever. Uh, but when you live life under eternal perspective, everything counts. Everything. And so he says this, the preacher, being wise, taught the people knowledge, weighing, and studying, and arranging many proverbs. The word proverbs comes from the root word which means rule. The sun ruled the day, the sun ruled the day and the moon ruled the night. That word rule, that, that beautiful root word is the exact same word for Proverbs. The root word is, um, and it carries this idea that these words are not only these important statements, but these are the words that are to rule our lives. So the book of Proverbs is much more than these short pithy statements. Right. This book is a book that teaches us how to live our lives, to rule our yeah. lives. And he says this, he says, um, the preacher sought to find words of delight or words of value or words of um, um, acceptance, okay? So that's the first word. This word, uh, words of delight, when a child reads something, he needs to read something that brings delight to his soul, value to his life, and it's acceptable. You feel it. You understand it. So that's yeah. the first, first word that he uses, the words of delight. Second is words of truth. And the third is words of the wise. And he says this, these words, tr delight, truth, and wisdom, need to be like goads, prickers, fastened like nails, given by, I love this, one shepherd. That phrase, one shepherd, appears four times in the Bible. Jesus quotes it himself in John chapter 10, and Jesus claims that he himself is the one, one shepherd. shepherd. Yeah. In Ezekiel, twice it's mentioned, it's referring to the Messiah to come. Yeah. Amazing. And uh, this one shepherd appears in the book of Ecclesiastes out of nowhere. There's no one shepherd in the entire book. It comes out of nowhere in the last paragraph of this amazing book. And Jesus says, I'm giving you words of delight, truth, and wisdom to be goads, to be fastened like nails, to be your worldview. Yeah. And then he says this, my son, beware anything beyond these. It's going to harm you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt your soul. Lot's righteous soul was vexed from day to day by the things he saw and heard. He didn't do the things. He just saw and heard them. Yvette, this is, for me, one of the most important things in my life because Satan is such a deceiver 
he's he's deceiving us to think that we can violate these standards. Yeah. You cannot violate the standards of delight, truth, and wisdom and, and escape the harmfulness of it. For example, right. um, dystopian literature, it's all over the place. More volumes sold than any other genre in this history, and it teaches four main basic truths. Don't trust parental authority. Don't trust legal authority. Don't trust um, government authority and become the authority of your, be your own authority. That's what it teaches. And, but people, because, because on the premise of false love, they're saying, no, we're going to bring love back into society by resetting society and discarding all the old things and starting something new. So the whole thing's based on the false premise of we're going to bring love back into the world by discarding the old and bringing in the new. And what they've done is they've become a law unto themselves right. and not following the laws of God. Right. You know, right. and so, so that's how harmful these things are. Harry Potter, um, dystopian literature, um, Call of the Wild. Some of the classic books that our children are reading and homeschooling today are extremely dangerous. If they do not possess a worldview that is, that is following the boundaries that God has set, God says, my son, if you violate these things, if you go beyond words of delight, acceptable, valuable, eternal, if you go beyond words of delight, words of truth, and words of wisdom, it will harm your soul. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, I, I say, let's do this for those parents out there that say, well, my children, though, they get to, they get to, to see both good and bad. They get to be able to process. They get to be able to think logically. They be able to, to, to gain. No, it's not true. That's not what's really happening. But listen to this. If you can gain an understanding of this book, if you could read it from Genesis to Revelation and study it and search for the truths like hidden treasure and fall in love with it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and like, for example, Psalm 1611, one of my favorite verses says, um, I will make known unto you the path of life. In my presence is fullness of joy. At my right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm, Psalm 8411 says, he's a sun and shield. He gives grace and glory and no good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. Um, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, um, 2 Chronicles 16, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole world, seeking those whose hearts are completely his. Yeah, completely are, his. Yeah, that's the Not key. Not just partly his. Yeah, and so, and so reading, reading is so powerful. It, it helps forms our values, our convictions, our worldview. And there are 2.2 million books out there every year. Let's find yeah. the books that our children, that are going to really uh, come alongside and align with God's delight, truth, and wisdom. Let's do that first. Let's give them 18 years of this. And then later on, if they want to go out there and study something, they've got a firm foundation. Right. I mean, I don't, yeah. I mean, I got three master's degree and a doctorate. I can hear, I can say this. You don't need any of those other books to help you in this life. In fact, if you have God's wisdom, you have everything you need for life and godliness.